Hello, today we are going to have a look at the 747 in Microsoft Flight Simulator. I do apologise, the, the fuel truck appears to be doing a 15 point turn right in front of the left hand engine. But anyway, uh, yes, we're going to be looking at the, the 747 in Flight Simulator. This, is, this has the Salty mod, or Salty Simulations mod installed. So if we go and have a look at that on the internet, if you head to GitHub and search for Salty Simulations, you will find the Salty 747 mod. And it improves the stock 747 enormously. It improves the avionics, it improves the flight model, it improves the systems within the cockpit. Um, if you are not so certain about installing things via the uh, a download from GitHub, you can go to the latest version of the fly-by-wire installer. So if you go and search for fly-by-wire on the internet and Microsoft Flight Simulator, you'll find this program. Typically, this has been used to install the Airbus, the fly-by-wire Airbus mod, but you will now find within its installer, you can now find the, the Salty Simulations 747 mod. So we're gonna have a fly with it today and have a play with it. You can see we are on the ground and we're going to have a look at the flight plan and see where we're at and where we're going to. So we are at Kingsford Smith Airport, which is in Sydney, in Australia. And we've made ourselves a nice little flight plan up. This, we've got various, various permissions from <laughs> aviation um, authorities to fly over the Sydney Harbour before we depart. So we'll go and have a look at the harbour. And then we're going to fly north up the coast to Brisbane and we're going to follow the GOMO 2A standard approach route into Brisbane and then land on runway 19 left and follow the ILS in. So this is mostly about seeing how the Salty mod handles basic controls along the way. Obviously there's going to be a cruise portion of the flight where we'll just set a nice view and watch the aeroplane flying along and I'll go make a coffee which has kind of <laughs> become my trademark thing to do mid-flight. Um, but yeah, we'll see how we go. Okay, so let me go and close down some of these things we don't need. So we don't need the web page open. Uh, all we need is little nav map. OBS is doing the recording and flight simulator. So the first thing we're going to do is get rid of all the ground crews and everything. So I have summoned them via the pushback mod for flight simulator. So normally you would use this to do pre-planned pushbacks and things like that. If you go to the aircraft tab in the pushback mod, you can actually summon or get rid of all of these various services. So we can get rid of the power truck now. And you notice he immediately follows our instruction. We can get rid of the catering truck, which is over there. So they'll start putting their stuff away. We didn't use the jetway. We have got the stairs. So we'll ask them to remove the stairs away now. Get rid of the baggage. So the, the baggage conveyor will be pulled away and the truck will drive away and we I think the doors will close automatically but we can get them to close as well so we can for example close that forward door let's see what happens when they pull away the baggage conveyor did they close the aft door yeah that's where the um, the catering truck pulled into earlier They're not in a hurry to get rid of the conveyor belt, are they? Maybe I have to close the door to get them to do that. So if I just close that, will he pull the truck away? You'd think he'd get the um, hint by now, wouldn't you? Okay, anyway. Oh, there he goes. He's got the hint at last. <laughs> Let's go and get inside the cockpit and power this plane up. So what do we need to do in a 747 in Microsoft Flight Simulator? So this is a little bit different than the stock one. So the first thing we're going to do is go and turn the battery on. So battery power is available. There we go. External power is available. So we will switch it on on both sides. We will go and turn the auxiliary power unit on because without the auxiliary power unit, we can't generate compressed air to spin up the engines. So we, we flick it to start and it flicks back to on all on its own. When it's ready, APU Gen will say avail on both sides of the aircraft. So we just have to wait for that to happen now. If we look down inside the cockpit, you can see 
the various screens have lit up. Now we have battery power, we have external power. You'll notice there's nothing on the map screens. That's because we need to align the navigation system. So we switch align. So this is the inertial navigation system which has gyros inside the aircraft which you know they detect movement of the aircraft which makes the navigation that much more accurate but they can only work if they are aligned so that takes them a while to calibrate and it can take several minutes that, but I'm going to show you something that will help you with that so we can get rid of the yoke out of the way for the moment so to help with that alignment process you will notice when you first look at the FMC the flight management computer this is not an MCDU that's an Airbus term this is a Boeing this is an FMC a flight management computer so you will notice on the index screen of the FMC there is a salty option and inside here you get some configuration options for the the mod itself and one of the top left one here is IRS so when you go to IRS you can say it's aligning at the moment and we can say instant align if we want okay we're not going to actually going to worry about that too much because we're going to be looking around the airplane and playing with things so we'll we'll let it carry on aligning all on its own okay so if we come and look back up here now we can see the APU gens are saying avail so we will switch them on okay so the APU is up and running the generators are now running so we could if we wanted to switch off the external power now and we have got various views that can help us see around the aircraft if we press control and 8 on the keyboard we get a nice straight view of the overhead panel so we can see where things are so in order to power up the engines we are not only going to need the APU bleed which is over here so we can do that across oops already on so we can also we, we will need fuel pumps so we can go and switch on fuel pumps for the various fuel tanks now we're going not going to do the central ones because I've not got any fuel in the central tanks so most of a 747's fuel comes from the wings so those great big fat wings on the 747 are full of fuel um, we're just having a look round so just seeing oh this should be set to auto as well the standby power and I'm just making sure I haven't missed anything your damper's already on. It's a little bit strange that so many switches are on by default, but that may be true of a real 747. I'm not a 747 pilot, but I would have expected many more switches to be off and, you know, for us to have to go configure them. Okay, so at the moment, the beacon is off. Okay, so your beacon light you would normally light as soon as you're intending to fire up the engines, which we are going to do in a few moments. But we're not going to do it yet because we're going to go and have a look down here so this still hasn't aligned so let's go and do this instant align and you will see suddenly the flight systems come to life yeah because it's got its inertial guidance it knows if we're going up or down for example so that's where the big jets get their vertical speed reference from they're actually measuring the acceleration of the aeroplane via the the INS system or the inertial guidance system um, Okay, so let's go and have a look at this flight computer and let's program the route in that we saw earlier. Okay, so we can go back to a menu, which takes us to the main menu, and we go to FMC, which is the flight management computer. And the first thing we're going to do is initialize the position of the aircraft. So we're going to put in our reference airport, so we want the ICAO code of the airport we are at which is YSSY for Kingford Smith International at Sydney. YSSY. So YSSY. In common with lots of aircraft systems, if you see square boxes, they are mandatory fields. If they are hyphens, they are optional fields. So we have typed in YSSY into the scratch pad, and then we've clicked on the soft key next to the field where we want to input. In the case of the GPS, we can pick up the GPS from this field, and then we can set the IRS reference position from the GPS because the 
big jets have two systems. They have the GPS, they also have the inertial system. So we're giving the inertial system a frame of reference of where we think it is in the world. So then any movement it detects, it can add and subtract from that reference position as it goes. And then obviously it will sync up with GPS along the way as well. So the idea there is the inertial system is independent of GPS for safety purposes. Okay, so we can go to Root. So in common with lots of other systems, I've mentioned this before, the next page to go to typically on setup is at the bottom right of, of the flight management computer. So we are now going to put in the origin airport for our route. So that is YSSY. And I'm not quite sure why this doesn't already have it in the scratch pad. As far as I was aware, on the Boeing FMCs, it carries that data into the scratch pad from the reference airport from the previous page. So it should have already really been there. Okay, so we've done YSSY. Where are we going to? We're going to Brisbane, which is YBBN. YBBN. So we put that into the destination. And we don't have to touch the company route. So we can then go to performance initialization. So the first thing it wants to know up here is the cruise altitude for our route. So we're going to say 306, uh, sorry, 36,000 feet. But we don't have to type 36,000. We can type it as a flight level, which is times 100. So it's hundreds of feet for the flight levels. So flight level 360 is 36,000 feet. So if we just type 360, it's clever enough to realize that that's what we meant. Cost index is how hard we can accelerate, so it's a formula, which we're not going to get into today, about how much fuel the aeroplane can use on its route. So we're just going to go, it's usually up to about 200 you can go up to, so we'll put 200 in there. But on, on normal operations of an aeroplane, you will rarely see above kind of 50. So, you know, obviously an airline is going to be very conservative about the amount of fuel they'll let the aeroplane burn. Cons reserves is how many thousand pounds of fuel we want left over at the end of the flight. So we'll say we want two thousand pounds left. So all this is really doing is calculating if we've got enough fuel to warn us if we haven't. Uh, thrust page, we don't have to do anything here. You can control basically the profile of the aircraft in its climb rate and things like that. We're not going to go anywhere near that. So take off. So we are going to take off with 10 degrees of flaps. And interestingly, it gives you the V-speeds here. So this is the minimums for making a decision about d d um, aborting the takeoff and climbing away and all the rest of it and rotate on the runway. And you can calculate these because we've set, we know how heavy the aeroplane is and we know what flat position we're going to have. So we can see what the rotate speeds are going to be. So, or the V-speeds, sorry, and the rotate speed. So 121, 135 and 157 knots, that's pre-calculated. So they will then appear, you can see them indicating as being off the far end of here, but they'll appear on the airspeed ribbon as we accelerate down the runway. You'll see them come past. So it's thrust, so we've already done that, so that's just cycling around in a circle now. So okay, so as part of the config we set the departure and um, destination airfields. So now we can go into the DEP R button and put in more details. So the first thing it's going to ask is about the departure from YSSY. So let's go and have a look in a bit more detail at the, the plan in Little Nav Map. So we are over here on the ground and we're going to be pushed back and just toodle on down to the runway just behind us for this example flight. We're going to be taking off runway 25. Okay, so we choose runway 25 on the departures and then it lists the standard instrument departures and now we're not going to use one. And that isn't a problem for the aeroplane, that's fine. And then we can execute that. This, interestingly, in this version of this aircraft there's something missing. If we go root, we should be able to activate and it doesn't work. So you have to execute here. Yeah, in, in this version, I imagine in the PMDG 737 that arrives, the activate button will work correctly. Anyway, so we've done the YSSY to YBBN. If we go to the, that was the departure. If we come back to the index, 
we can see this is the depth our index page and then we can say we want to set up the arrival and we can go and choose the arrival into uh, Brisbane so 19 left following the GOMO 2A standard approach route so ILS for 19 left perfect and they want the GOMO 2A and there it is and then we can execute that and you will notice there's various things are changing here but we're not seeing much because we're zoomed out or zoomed all the way in I should say if we start zooming out to show one mile two miles it's, the way I know this is halfway along this line it tells me how far that is so that's obviously a five mile range and it also corresponds up here look with the range so we can say 10 miles 20 40 obviously facing the direction we're facing we can't see any of the flight plan because it's all behind us so what we can do is go and finish off the rest of the flight plan so at the moment it's showing on the legs page a discontinuity basically because all we've told it is we're leaving here and we're arriving there but we've put not put anything in in between so it's asking us what do we want to do next after we leave runway 25 so when we leave runway 25 at Sydney for our little mini flight plan here we're going to go to Vidic as our first waypoint so we key in V I D I K and you can see it entering into the scratch pad down here and then we enter the soft key next to where we want to insert it and it's done it so you can see the lines are starting to appear on the flight plan then we want to go to RKWC so we key in RKWC and now where are we going to put it so if you have not got a discontinuity to slot the um, the fix into or the waypoint into what you do is you select an existing waypoint and it will push that one down and make room for the one you have keyed in so we w we need to go ahead of Gommel so we go click on Gommel and it's now put RKWC in front of Gommel and we can continue doing that for the rest of our waypoints so the next one we want is no HD N O H D so that's in the scratch pad and then we click on Gommel again to push it further down and no HD now appears in front of Gommel now next on our route if we zoom out we've got NBB that we also need to go in front of Gommel N B B so we select Gommel and it will inject it in front of it now what do we do now we go next page and then we can continue putting things in front of Gommel so then we're going to go to Nelson N E L S N N E L S N that's correct put that in front of Gommel again and then we're going to carry on down to where is it let's zoom out quite a long leg there C F S S H C F S S H and again in front of Gommel and then Spark is the final waypoint because Gommel is the beginning of the standard approach route so we just need to put in Spark because you will see Gommel is already there now there are three Sparks so what we can do in little nav map just to check usually when an FMC or an MCDU shows you several options usually the one at the top is the closest to where you are but just to be certain what we can do in little nav map is right click on spark and show information and it gives us its coordinates so the one at 20 degrees 58 minutes 28 degrees or sorry 58 seconds it's 54 look here that's a oh so it is 54 sorry 2854 there you go so we select that one and it inserts it into the the plan for us okay so now if we start looking around or start you can see a dotted line which gives us our route 
Now, why is it a dotted line? Let's go and have a look. If we click next page and next page, there is a vector in the root and a discontinuity on the end. So if we delete that discontinuity. Oh, invalid delete. The reason for that will be because there's a vector right in front of it. So if we go previous page and delete the vector, uh, clear the can we clear? Is it going to let me? Yeah, here we go. If we delete the vector and execute these changes, there we go. We now have a solid line. So the flight plan is correct and it will be followed. If we don't get a solid line, the autopilot will not follow the flight plan. OK, so we can do some other bits and pieces to get the airplane ready. But we've done the flight plan. And before we do anything else, let's just... <laughs> We're not going to do everything perfectly in order here because this is really about showing you around the airplane and show you what works. The, unfortunately, the tablets don't work. That's a shame, but it would, you know, usually the tablets just have helping applications anyway. Um, something we're going to do, which will be good fun, is to go and use the pushback tool now because we really want to go and start the engines up. We've set the, um, the flight plan up. So if you remember, if we press Control and 8, there were some lights over here. So we are going to set the beacon lights to both. If we go and look outside, we can see what the beacon lights are doing. So it's this little light here, and there's one underneath as well that corresponds with it. Can we see it easily from here? There it is. It's right underneath the belly of the aeroplane. So the beacon lights basically are warning anybody on the ground that we're about to start the engines or, you know, or operations that people need to be aware that we're about to move basically so we have this pushback mod and we're going to have some fun with it so we go to pushback and we can pre-plan our pushback so what this means is we can tell the ground crew where we want the airplane moved to so we can use the control and the mouse wheel to zoom out and we can say we want that's where we're parked we want the airplane moved, please, to here, ready to taxi. OK, so we just do that and press Enter. And now we've planned our pushback. Now we can request our pushback. Cockpit to ground. Cockpit to ground. This is ground. Cockpit to ground. Stand by. This is ground. Stand by. This is ground. Stand by. Oh, dear. There seems to be an issue going on with that. I, th I wonder if it's because I flicked a switch as it was just getting fired up. Something else I've just remembered I haven't done, and again, I should have done this really before I started with the simulator, is I haven't configured my controls. So I need to go into here and change the configuration of my controls to make them work for the 747, because I haven't done that yet. So I've got a setting in here specifically for the 747 there it is apply go back resume let's cancel that pushback parking brakes are set you may lift parking brakes set lifting the aircraft that's doing it okay we'll just let it go on with it. i think it got caught in a loop because i flicked a switch at the time it was doing it so you can see the nose going up so they're basically ready to push back now so if we press Reverse now. Cockpit to ground. Go ahead. We are cleared for start and push. Parking brake set. Okay, cleared for push start. Please release parking brake. Okay, so I'm going to release the parking brake. Parking brakes are released. Commencing pushback. You can start the engines in sequence. Yeah, we'll start in the sequence. Okay, so we are being pushed back. We can actually tell it the speed to push us. Now, because it had that issue, <laughs> I'm not quite sure what went on there. I don't think it's going to do the planned pushback. So it's just going in a straight line. Yeah. So we can actually steer it, though, with the rudder. So I've just told it to go in a direction and it's doing it. So I think that what caused the problem earlier, as it was busy talking to me, I realised 
but I hadn't got the parking brake on and I went and quickly put it on and I think it was enough to get it snickers in a twist basically and it didn't quite know what it was up to anymore so we can just wait for this pushback while the pushback is happening we will get the engine started as they said so to get the engine started on the 747 we need to pull the starters up here we're going to do all four at once which is strictly not correct so we've switched on all the starters and now we can switch on the fuel control for each engine and you will see the the numbers are coming up for all the engines normally you would do them one at a time you can see it's got an, a, a warning here about the window heats aren't switched on so if we again press control 8 you will see window heats are here so we've now done that and let's have a look outside and see how the pushback's going got plenty of time Go for a sharper angle. Okay, so then we can stop the pushback. Okay, pushback completed. So we'll turn our parking brake back on. Parking brake set. Oh, it's a shame that parking the pre-planned pushback didn't work. That was obviously because I was meddling with things while it was doing it. Ground. Startup is complete. You may disconnect. Roger. Good engine start. Clear to disconnect. So we can decide. Have a good flight. Okay, so. Position waiting for the visual. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs> there seems to be a bug over there. I've seen that a few times recently, actually, with um, static aircraft spinning on the spot. Not quite sure what causes it. Bit of a strange one. Anyway. So we are going to turn on the flight directors. We are also going to start getting things ready on in terms of the aircraft. So we can turn on the navigation lights. We won't turn the strobes on until we're in the air because they might blind people on the ground. They're very powerful lights. Um, we can now we have the engines running. The crossfeed will automatically have switched over. It does on the 747, it doesn't on the old 737s. So now we can turn off the APU. So we can turn off the APU gens. And so the generation is now coming from the engines. Oh, we can also go overhead and turn the INS system to nav instead of align. I don't think it makes any difference in terms of this simulation. It's not clever enough for that to make a difference. But it's just something to be aware of. Uh, so the next thing we're going to do... Again, I'm doing things a little bit out of order, but it, it doesn't matter because we're just covering bases, really. The next thing we're going to do is look at the master control panel for the autopilot. So we're taking off runway 25. So we'll go and pre-configure this with the right kind of heading. So we're going to spin this round what the idea here is because we could use nav mode or l nav mode which is lateral navigation mode on the autopilot so i should probably explain this is the master control panel for the autopilot so this is where you direct the airplane to do what you want without you having to do it yourself so we can set although lateral navigation it can see the flight plan it knows which way to go in case we had a problem with that, we can back that up by putting a manual heading in. So if we did go to heading hold mode, we could have the heading ready to go. Uh, uh, same is true of the indicated airspeed for takeoff. We, we do have auto throttle on the 747, but we're going to configure it to do what we want on takeoff. So we'll go to 220 knots straight from takeoff because we can engage speed mode once, once we are rolling. We'll engage speed mode and arm it, and that means the auto throttles come on and will get us to 220 knots. The flight director that I switched on, the autopilot is two different systems. There's the flight director, which figures out what to do to follow the flight plan. So it's the you see it as a pair of crosshairs. The the kind of are they magenta or I can never quite tell what colour they are. Um, 
there's a crosshair on the attitude indicator that is the flight director trying to figure out what to do to to follow the flight plan so basically the the flight director figures out what to do the autopilot just blindly follows it so if you turn off the flight director you have essentially made switched off the autopilot because it is then blind um got vertical speed mode so we want to climb out but we need to set a target altitude to do so so you would typically go for we're going to go to 36,000 feet but we're not going to straight away because we want to fly around the harbour so we'll go no higher than than say 3,000 feet to begin with yeah and we can select the altitude we can also go vertical speed mode and say we want to climb out at a given rate So we could say climb out at two and a half thousand feet a minute, which a 747 with a light load can easily do. It has four very powerful engines. OK, so the trick here is we're going to use LNAV mode. We could use heading hold mode and it will keep on at 250 degrees. But if we go for LNAV mode, that's lateral navigation mode, that means the aircraft will follow this flight plan for us or do its best to follow it. And that's what's going to be interesting for us, is to see how well it does at doing that. The other thing we can do is go and set the barometric pressure on the altitude, so we know our accurate altitude above sea level. Now, at the moment it's reading 29.92 inches. So what we can do is go and go to Kingsford Smith and show information on Kingsford Smith, and you get a METAR readout here. Now this is showing the reading as 1022 which is obviously not in the same range, so there's a, a setting up here for inches or hectopascals. So the 1022 that we read here is the barometric pressure in hectopascals. So we can change that we've changed the measurement scale on the barometric pressure reading and then we can roll the inner knob to set it to 1022 and you can see the altitude changing. 21, 22. So we're about 30 feet above sea level, 25 feet above sea level, which makes sense if you think about it, because we're on the harbour. Okay. So that's about it. We're ready to go. We've got vertical speed mode ready. We've got a backup heading ready. We've got LNAV enabled. We've got a target altitude. We've got a vertical speed to get there we haven't set the flaps yet so we are going to set the flaps so I've moved the flap lever two notches and you can see the desired setting and you can see the rate of the flap moving to get there because if you look very closely at the flaps I don't know if we're going to get there quickly enough they take a while to move you can see them just gently moving and the wing reconfiguring itself it takes a while in a 747 because it's a huge amount of wing area that's being rearranged. The aeroplane's still doing loops in the background. And you can see the leading edge slats have come out as well. They've unfolded from underneath. OK, I think it's about time we got on our way, isn't it? We've sat here talking for ages and ages about all these different things. And we've not actually gone anywhere yet. So we just make sure that the control throws are working correctly. So we've got brakes and we can see that working from outside so if we switch on the air brakes you can see those flaps along the top of the wing lift up uh, obviously we've already moved the flaps so we'll center the view up we'll come off the parking brake and we're rolling so there's a small positive amount of thrust happening as uh, you know as soon as we don't touch the brakes so we're turning immediately to go out onto runway 25. So we're not going to be bothering with ATC today because it will just get in the way of me talking. Which is more interested in seeing how well this aeroplane behaves at following the flight plan really. Okay, 
so we're lined up we're going to push the engines forward gently somebody crossing the runway right in front of us all sorts of aviation laws just got broken but then we have no ATC so they would have probably held us for ages so watching the numbers the V rotate has just come up we just straighten us up and we begin rotating and we're off the ground gear up we're still accelerating so flaps up and engage autopilot engage the auto throttle so it's now going to go for 220 knots so you can see the throttles are moving all on their own we can lift the flaps and the plane is now flying itself and we are waiting for it to start the turn which it should do very very soon so if we look from outside oh we didn't turn all our lights on did we let's go and do that quickly oh it was on already the nav lights were on strobe lights were we now need the strobe light that was it sorry i'm forgetting myself so you don't use the strobe light until you're in the air because you could blind people on the ground you would typically i guess switch it on on the runway there seems to be a fair debate about the correct use of lights but the general gist is beacon goes on before you start the engines the anti-collision or um, position lights or nav lights go on while you're moving on the ground just to aid for you know um, orientation and then the strobes go on when you're on the runway or in the air so we are following the plan unfortunately it's a foggy day I was hoping we were going to get to see Sydney we program this lovely flight plan where we circle Sydney Harbour and fly directly out past the city so we'll see how it goes we might come out of this low cloud we could always change it quickly in the cockpit so let's go back down to 2500 feet at a vertical speed of a thousand feet a minute Let's see if that gets us low enough just to miss these clouds to get a nice view of the city. Just make sure that's happening. Yeah, we're coming down to two and a half thousand feet. But I think the clouds are going to um, ruin our day somehow. So, so far this 747 is behaving impeccably. It's matching the speed, it's flying the route that we programmed and it's just getting on with it. So oh, we're going to get a break in the cloud at the perfect moment to see the city and the harbour bridge. How great is that? You'll notice the 747 is flying at quite a nose high attitude it really doesn't like flying this slowly especially without the flaps so we are in the region where we could have five degrees of flap but we're not we're not using it so we're going to fly past the this is the version of sydney with the world update applied so we are seeing a more accurate version of sydney than with the stock simulator i've got live weather on so this is apparently what um, Sydney looks like this morning. So what day is it today? It's the 20th, Wednesday the 20th, or in the evening of Wednesday the 20th for me. It'll be Thursday the 21st in Australia. At about half seven in the morning. Let's have a look at the Harbour Bridge. And there's the Opera House. So if we zoom in, you can see it as we go past. 
So we did get a clear view in the end. It wasn't too bad. Okay, so we're coming up to a turn, and then we will begin our climb out away from Sydney. So we've got our fun sightseeing tour behind us, and we'll see how we do the climb next. So, until we get to 10,000 feet, we have to stay below 250 knots, or 250 or below. So we're going to select 250 knots, and you can see the throttles are moving as I do that to take us to 250. And it, they got us there very, very smartly indeed. We are now going to go straight for our cruise altitude. Normally you'd be doing a stepped climb through managed airspace with ATC, but we're going to go straight for 36,000 feet in one go and let the aeroplane get us there. So we just roll our mouse on the altitude knob until it comes up to 36,000. There we go. And we select that altitude and then we can choose our vertical speed to get there. So we go vertical speed mode. We'll say, okay, we would like to get there, please. At For the first part of this climb, we'll go for 3,000 feet a minute. So you can see the aircraft is accelerating, or it's opening the engines to maintain 250 knots at 3,000 feet a minute. So you can see it's stabilizing. It's got to just about 3,000 feet a minute on the vertical speed and we're climbing towards 36,000 in vertical speed mode, lateral navigation mode and auto throttle is on. And we can zoom out and we can see projected onto the map where we will get to the target altitude. So in about 30, no uh, 30 nautical miles down range we will get to, th if we maintain this climb rate, which we won't be able to, because the air gets thinner as we get higher, so we won't be able to maintain 3,000 feet a minute. And plus, we're going to meddle around, once we get through 10,000 feet, we're going to accelerate. The other thing we'll have to keep in mind is, once you go through 18,000 feet, which is, I haven't actually checked, different areas of the world have a thing called a transition level or a transition altitude, I should say. And the transition altitude is where you switch the... Con the um, what's the word? The calibration of the barometric pressure for the altimeter to a standard number, which would be 1013 in hectopascals or 2992 if we were in inches. So above eight, it's typically 18,000 feet most places around the world, so we'll use it as a reference. I'm not sure what it should be for Eastern Coast Australia. So if we go and have a look on the um, flight management computer, we can go to the progress page and you can see what our next waypoint is and the ETA to get there. So it gives you the next couple of waypoints and then it gives you the destination. It also tells you how much fuel you will have left over. So we're doing a very, very short flight for a 747. Remember, a 747 could very easily get to um, halfway around the world. So we've just gone through 10,000 feet, so we can accelerate now. So let's push this on to 340 knots. The 747 is fast. Now you will notice the vertical speed is possibly going to drop. Oh no, it's holding on to it. So yeah, the mighty old 747 with its four engines can accelerate and climb at 3,000 feet a minute. It would be interesting, I'm not going to do it today, it would be interesting to force the vertical speed higher to see what takes precedence. Getting to a target airspeed or getting to a target climb rate. So we didn't put the seatbelt sign on, did we? We forgot completely about the passengers. So they're merrily dancing up and down the aisles, probably. So the seatbelt sign in the 747 is down here at the side of the 
side of the um, pilot. In many other aircraft, it's along here, but in the 747, it's way down there. I think in the 737, it's fairly central, actually. OK, so we're climbing, and we're still maintaining 3,000 feet a minute, which is quite stunning, really. So we're coming up through 15,000 feet. As we come through 18, we will reconfigure the barometric pressure on the altimeter. So we're still accelerating, coming up to 340 knots. You will see a red striped line on the airspeed ribbon. That is the overspeed mark on the ribbon. So woe betide anybody that goes faster than the overspeed mark. You will notice as well we can switch the mark, sorry, the indicated airspeed over to a Mach number which you would typically do once you get through the transition altitude. But we're doing it now just to show you it. So that's expressing our speed as relative to the speed of sound. Because you will notice the indicated airspeed gets less and less as you get higher because it, it indicated airspeed is measured by air pressure hitting a sensor. And as you get higher in the atmosphere, the air gets thinner so the airspeed that you are being shown from that sensor becomes more and more inaccurate or it becomes less and less relative to your ground speed which is why you can see ground speed up here so we're only showing 324 indicated 323 indicated we're actually doing 440 knots over the ground yeah because we're at 20,000 feet and that's going to get worse. That disparity will get worse and worse the higher we get. Because the indicated airspeed is measured by air pressure hitting a sensor. Ground speed is figured out using the inertial navigation system and the GPS in concert with one another. OK, we can see we've got a 30 knot crosswind at this altitude. It's not unusual at high altitudes to get extremely strong winds. Shall we have a look outside? It's a very pretty aeroplane, isn't it? So it's not Oh no, it's still holding on to 3,000 feet a minute. I'm surprised at that. I thought we would have had to curtail our stratospheric climb rate. Ah, oh, it's, it's favouring indicated airspeed over the target. So should we go for a bit faster? You'll notice this had fallen away from where it was before. Remember, as we get higher, indicated airspeed falls away. One of the attractions of going to Mach number is it doesn't track directly against the, you know, the, in, the, the actual speed, or sorry, the indicated speed. So it's much more accurate to, or more relational to the ground speed. So we've actually already gone through 18,000 feet, I forgot to mention while we were on our way up, so we can switch the barometric pressure. Now you notice, instead of tuning it to 1013, we c it says STD in the middle of the, the button, which means standard. So if we click it, it says STD, and it's essentially gone to 1013 or 2992 for us. So the next time we change it is when we are descending into Brisbane, we will find out the atmospheric pressure reading for the uh, the destination airfield and we will program that in during our descent okay let's have a look and little nav map and see where we are so we took off out of Sydney and we're climbing up we're approaching this dog leg that we put into the flight plan to stay along the coast
and the aircraft is struggling look to get to the target airspeed so it is favoring climb rate so what we will do is reduce the vertical speed now now having reduced the requirement for climbing we're giving it more of a chance to get to the target airspeed as well you will notice and this was part of that configuration screen we saw in the FMC at the start it's only pushing the engines to 88.5 percent so we've got quite a margin there if we were to switch the auto throttle off and push the engines on a Boeing you can actually go beyond 100 percent so you can really push the engines just to illustrate that I'll do it for you so I'll disengage the auto throttle look at the percentages so I've just pushed the engines against the stops so it's going to 98.8 percent at the moment so then we'll rearm the auto throttle and they'll jump back and this will come back to 85 percent because that's the number that had been pre-configured in the performance characteristics when we set the aircraft up So one of the nice things that's in the 747 that's not in many of the others, the weather radar works, not that there's any radar to see it, any sorry, any weather to see at the moment. It says WXR when it's showing it. Obviously there's nothing to see, so if we increase the range, are we gonna see anything up here? No, it's a clear day. Yeah. So at altitude, look there's no there's no cloud up here, that's all low level cloud. So we should begin to make our turn to head up the coast in a moment. So we're coming up towards 36,000. How are we doing on the volume levels? I haven't even looked at the volumes. So I make the engines a bit louder for you. So you can actually hear something. Okay, let's increase the range on this a bit further. That's 160 miles. 320 miles. Okay. So I'm going to leave this recording because we don't really need to do anything now. We can turn the seatbelt sign off, I guess. Not that it was on when we took off, but this is really about showing you functionality more than anything, though. So it's telling me now I've turned the seatbelt signs off, which is fine. One of the things that's a little bit poor in this, even though it flies very nicely and the FMCs work nicely, the screens and the switches between the pilot and the co-pilot are not independent, and they should be. The huge advantage of having independent screens comes on landing, or on approach, where you can be showing the map in what it calls map mode on the display on one side, and then you can change the other one to approach mode to show the um, the CDI, the course deviation indicator. So you can see both screens at a glance. I mean, it's kind of a hybrid view anyway in the 747. You'll see it a bit later on. But um, yeah, it, it's a shame that you can't have the independent screens. It does save on workload though. Because if it worked absolutely accurately, you'd have to double your work up between all the switches. Like, for example, when we press standard on one side, it did it on both sides. What should really happen is you do one side and not the other, and you get a discrepancy warning pops up that, you know, they don't match. You will notice also on a 747 there are three autopilots. So I'm not sure how accurately it's measured or modelled in this version. And again, the engineering displays, there should be a whole load of different things we can show here. But again, I'm not sure how well modelled they are, or even if they are modelled. Yeah, there's various knobs that are inoperative that should be, you know, that would do all kinds of nice things for us that we can't get to, which is a shame. Notice you have another FMC down here. 
So as well as the pilot and the co-pilot having one, there's a backup one down here. So we've just come up to 36,000 feet and the aircraft has oversped as it climbed, which was interesting. I wasn't watching that, unless the wind has just changed, of course. That could also have affected it. OK, so we've got about 300 miles to go. So I'm going to set the view up outside for a while. And you can enjoy the scenery as we go along the coast of Australia. And I will disappear for a bit and come back ready for approach. So I'll pull up the flight map. Actually, I'll show you a neat trick. Rather than use that flight map, what I'm going to do is open Little Nav Map. Now, oh, a fatal error has occurred in Little Nav Map. Oh, that's a shame. That means it's lost our route. <laughs> and I don't think it will have remembered it because I didn't save it. Yeah, it's got a completely different route. So if I go File, New... Oops. New Flight Plan. And center it on us in the world it really doesn't matter that we haven't got the flight plan um, we can say we'll just put that we'll pencil in the details we can I can show you how we can work this backwards actually which is quite neat so we took off from Sydney set that as the departure we're going up to Brisbane set that as the destination show the arrival procedures so we're quickly going to work back through this we're a landing 19 left, insert 19 left. We are going on the GOMO 2 star, insert the GOMO 2 star. And we just need to put in some of these waypoints that we were using on the way out. So no HD was one of them. So let's just bear in mind, we came through Nelson. That's all we need to know for the line we're on. Uh, if we go back inside the aeroplane and have a look at the legs page, we can see Spark Gommel. Yeah, CFS, CFSSH, Spark and, and Spark. CFSSH. So we can search for them in the NAVAIDS. CFSSH. Add to flight plan and then spark it's going to be somewhere out here isn't it there it is add spark so the reason for doing this if we go and then get rid of that in little nav map you can save layouts so I've got a saved layout so if we go to open window layout I can say I want my minimal window layout and it's got rid of all the stuff around the outside the trick being we can now make this nice and small and we can use it on the outside view. So we'll go into the simulator, we'll press end, we'll get this so we've got a nice view of the world going by, and then we get a little nav map in front of it, and you get to see where we are on the route quite nicely. The other thing is, you probably don't want this showing up, so we can go to Taskbar Settings in Windows, and we can go to Task Behaviour, Taskbar Behaviours. We can say Automatically Hide It, thank you very much. So then, when this has the focus, we get the full screen on the simulator, and we get a little nav map showing our route. And obviously this is a, a lot nicer than the stock simulator map and it's centering on the aircraft automatically for us so we'll just leave it like that and we get to watch the world go by so I'm going to turn my microphone off for a while and I will be back soon I'm going to go and make a coffee so I'm just going to go and cut my microphone off and I'll be back soon
Okay, I'm back. Let's have a look and see how this aeroplane is doing. And it looks like it's having a bit of a nightmare with the wind. We've got 90 knot crosswinds. And the plane is fighting it. Whoa, look at that. 90 knots from 285 degrees. Look at the amount we are crabbing across the route. So I noticed that just looking at a little nav map. The amount we are pointing across the... So you can see there, the arrow, the line is the direction we're going versus the direction the aeroplane is pointing. And you can see it here as well. That's the direction we're pointing. This line indicates our direction of travel. So the aeroplane is going to hit the waypoint. I mean, it's spectacularly good at this. The autopilot is always very good at this. But you can see the flight director is really fighting to keep the plane on track. So if we reduce the range slightly on here, do we get a projected... Oops. Uh, a projected top of descent I think it's here at spark but I'm going to come down before then or at least begin descending before then so we're not in a major hurry so the first thing we're going to do is pull up little nav map while we're on route and just have a look at our entry into the standard approach route so we'll go back to the window layout in little nav map and we'll reset the window layout back to default which gives it all of the various bits plugged back in We'll switch some of it off. We haven't got the... When we reprogrammed this route quickly, we didn't put in our um, approach. There we go. So top of descent is showing on here. Pretty much the same as the aircraft is thinking. At Spark, it wants to begin descending. So there's the top of descent marker. So that's based... In Little Navmap, that is based upon... The aircraft performance and I have got an aircraft performance file for the 747 so it's using that to predict where I need to start descending obviously it's based on payload as well so little nav map doesn't know how much fuel how much um weight we've got on board and it's it's got a complaint here because we didn't match up the Approach 19 left with star 19 right. Oh, have I picked the wrong star? Let's have a look. GOMO 2A, 19 left. Runway mismatch. Let's Okay, then, let's have a look. Right-click, show arrival procedures. Maybe I just keyed it into here. 19 left, GOMO 2A. Insert into start. Yeah, I got... I picked the wrong one when I was rebuilding the route in Little Nav Map. So now the warning has gone away. Okay, that's fine. And you can see on this altitude plot now where we are. So top of descent just before Spark. This is based on a gliding descent profile. Obviously if we use air brakes we can come down a lot more steeply. But we'll do pretty much what it says on the tin. Now hopefully it should be good. So we're going to turn off the centering now so we get to see this how and where we want the display to show up so we'll minimize this so we can see more of the route. So the reason I've really come in here is to see if there are any restrictions on the route. So by the time we get to Salel which is over here we need to be above 9,000 feet below 12,000 feet so we'll go for 10,000 feet, yeah? So we'll start descending for 10,000 feet as our initial descent. And then you can see above 5,000 feet, below 230 knots for OMGOV. So by the time we make our turn towards the airfield, we have got not only altitude restrictions, but speed restrictions as well. So we need to be down to 230 knots but to be honest when we come down through 9000 feet we'll be at uh, 250 knots then anyway so that's m not much of a reduction to make and then obviously down to 185 so as we turn this corner 230 
then as we straighten up for the runway we're down to 185 knots and obviously we'll be down to 150 160 in the ILS so that's all fine obviously as soon as you pick up uh, Ogatu we should pick up the ILS see there's the feathers so shortly before we should pick up ILS have approach mode on and come in pretty much fully automatically so we'll see how we get on it'd be interesting to see if this has auto land I'm not sure that it does but we'll find out if it engages flare mode in the um, in the system we'll find out won't we okay so we're about 80 miles out from spark so I'm going to go drink my coffee and wait for events to unfold We have a little look around the 747 while we're en route. simulator has the capacity to look spectacularly good doesn't it switch to the drone camera we can go and fly around the aircraft to 
happy I'm looking in the cup there. <laughs> job to keep up with them isn't it with the plane swaying around or rather with the autopilot swaying the aircraft around to try and match the route fantastic really isn't it the the reflections of those engines in the body and the ribs I mean I understand technically how it's done with bump mapping and things like that but it's very very clever the the overall effect is stunning really and you can zoom in to make a more of a telephoto kind of view gives much more weight to it doesn't it on a more of a telephoto view so we mentioned earlier about the sensors in the measuring the airspeed you can see them around the aircraft there's all sorts of sensors measuring the air and backup sensors we also mentioned about the lights earlier. So there's those lights that are indicating. You can see them flashing away. See, I wonder how close we can get to them to have a, a good look at them. Somebody cleaned that glass and scratched it. <laughs> That'd be for it if I catch them. So remember we talked about the APU earlier, the auxiliary power unit. That's the small jet engine that lives in the tail. There's the exhaust for it. There's obviously another navigation or anti-collision light. That might be one of the strobes actually. I'm not quite sure which one's which. Obviously the beacon that we saw earlier is right underneath the belly here. Even the modelling of the, the metal of the engines is pretty spectacular, isn't it? And the heat haze, obviously. You can see the distortion behind the engine. It's just mad, isn't it? The level of detail they've gone to. And it's throwing this around at how many frames a second? How many how many hundred thousand polygons did it take to render this aircraft? I wonder if we go up against the engine close. At what point it breaks down. It looks pretty good, doesn't it? It doesn't really lose the illusion. It's difficult to stay in front of the engine with the aeroplane swaying around there. And obviously we can go up in the air and look down at the aircraft as well.
Okay, let's go back inside and see how we're doing. So we're just coming up to top, top of descent. So we will begin descending, first of all, to 10,000 feet. So let's do that. So we're just moving the target altitude to 10,000 and we select it and we can choose a vertical speed to get there. Now we can see that line that comes in as soon as we choose a vertical speed. So we know, referring back to our flight plan, if we go back into little map, nav map and reset the window layout and get this back up, we can see on here we need to be at 10,000 feet by Salel which is here so we're not descending quite sharply enough at that rate so we can descend a bit further and this line will come in closer so we need it to match at Salel to be at 10,000 feet a little bit more so 1700 feet a minute what we're looking for here is the aircraft isn't accelerating too much if we also set the target airspeed to do 250 knots then we haven't got a panic when we get to 10,000 feet to, to get below 250 knots. So the fact that we can slow down without air brakes means we could actually descend faster if we wanted to which surprises me. I would have thought 1700 would be about the limit before we would start accelerating in a 747 but we appear to have a small amount of margin because you can see the rate of change here is slightly negative on the speed at 1700 feet a minute so we can pull the range in now on this display so we can see it a bit more in a bit more detail so we've hit our target airspeed so let's lessen off. We don't need to be at 10,000 until we get to Salel. So we can slacken off this descent rate. And every time we slacken it, you can see the, the point at which we will get to that altitude goes further out. It's worth pointing out, this marker is not along the flight plan. It's along our direction of travel. we've still got a 70 knot wind from part, part of that wind is a headwind part of it is from the side of the fuselage but we're coming down now through 31 th yeah 31 and a half thousand feet just approaching and we're beginning our descent so we will ask the passengers to get their seat belts back on And the depart oh sorry, the descent in any aircraft really into a standard approach route is just being methodical and following the rules. Obviously, you know, if you've never done this before, there's kind of a lot to think about in terms of okay, so I need to be changing the barometric pressure at eighteen thousand feet or whatever the transition altitude is for the area. You need to be at two fifty knots for ten thousand feet. And then you follow on your standard approach route. All it really is is a series of places to be in the sky and altitudes to be between or above in this case and speeds to be at at those places. And all it's really about is if you imagine a busy airspace, it's so air traffic control can essentially put people on pre-planned routes and then not have to worry too much about what each particular aircraft is doing next because if they continue to follow the instructions then it lessens the load for the controller and it means everybody can be coming in on planned routes and avoiding each other by following the routes they should be on and the heights and directions they should be at so it just makes a nice safe airspace for everybody 
So hopefully our approach into Brisbane should be pretty undramatic. We just methodically follow the route down. Slow the aeroplane down, extend the flaps when it's appropriate to do so. Turn the landing lights on, drop the undercarriage. Approach mode on. You know, we'll, we'll play with all these things on the way down. And just to functionally see how things work. Now, you'll have seen I've made mistakes earlier in the flight with bits and bobs. Again, I'm not a professional pilot and I'm not working to a checklist here. I'm using my memory today. So there were things like, you know, I forgot about the seat belts, I forgot about the nav lights, or sorry, the strobe lights. Um, when we when we initially pulled away from the um, the parking, there were things I hadn't done in the order I should have, or that I should have pre-prepared and I hadn't done. But again, if you're working to a checklist, that obviates all of those mistakes. So if you're working to a checklist, you just methodically go through the checklist, which a professional pilot would do. But again, I'm just doing this off the cuff, and this is more about the functional understanding of what's going on. Something I haven't touched on at all today is VNAV. So this aircraft does have VNAV. You can see the button over here. So there's LNAV, which we're using, which is lateral navigation, and we're controlling our vertical position by hand. What VNAV should do, and again, I'm not entirely sure this aircraft will do it correctly, is where you can program in heights and speeds on the right hand side of the legs page it means that the aircraft will try to follow them itself yeah so it's essentially hands off so rather than us controlling it in a way it's more fun for us to control it because it gives us something to do you see the it's one thing i do like about the boeings compared to the airbuses is you get to watch the throttles moving around Whereas on an Airbus, the throttle is really just a digital switch where you set it into various detents which correspond with different programs of operation. So we're just coming down to 25,000 feet. We're just... It's looking... Because the wind is changing, obviously, on the way down, which is affecting the point at which we're going to get to 10,000 feet, and it's swaying either side of our target. So let's go down a little bit more steeply and make sure we get down ahead of time. It's interesting, isn't it? Because on a real flight, if you've been on real flights, you'll no doubt know that the, the flight crew talk to the passengers during the descent as well so they'll pick these quiet moments to make their announcements about you know they might be saying oh we're 20 minutes early or we're late or whatever and informing about um, connecting flights and things like that and letting passengers know where they need to go in the destination airport so there's there's these kind of these quiet moments where the flight crew typically will go and talk to the passengers on the PA system and let them know about things that are going on. So there's, there's always something to do. And obviously while you might think the flight crew have nothing to do in the middle of a flight with the autopilot on, well they're monitoring the systems, they're scanning everything repeatedly. They never have a... they never switch off. Because the, the flight crew are there to make sure the aircraft is operating correctly and they'll be looking through far more than I am looking through all the engineering screens and everything you know monitoring temperatures the hydraulic systems all kinds of stuff and we haven't touched on any of that today just to give you an idea of some of the things if we go and look here whoops are these operational on this no that's inoperative oh that's a shame can we not change any of them no. We can change the mode of this screen. So we can put it into VOR mode, you can show it in map mode, you can show it in plan mode. So what plan mode should do is you can then step through the waypoints. Yeah, and that, that works. 
so we can step through the waypoints that are on the legs page and you can see each one illustrated so if we look a bit more closely here look, you can see um, it's centered on ISPON at the moment which it says CTR next to it so as we click step it will go to the next one so OMGOV is now centered and the zoom control works so you can get you know more or less detail so you can get to step through your steps typically you would do this just after programming it so you can see what's coming but then you can switch back to map mode and I'll increase the range again so you can see we're just coming up to Salel we're at still at 20,000 feet we've got 20 miles to go until we're predicted to be at 10,000 so again the wind has slackened off even further and because that's less of a headwind component we're now getting close to Salel even at 1700 feet a minute so let's go for a 2000 feet a minute descent rate now that this will be this will be interesting to see if we hit um, idle on the engines and yes it's actually gently starting to accelerate look it can't glide So we go back 18. It couldn't quite glide at 2,000 feet a minute and still hold on to 250 knots. But we're fine. So what happens after Salel? So we need to be below 12,000, so we'll be fine. Salga, we need to be at 9,000. So let's go and see where Salga is. It's the next waypoint along the coast here. So we need to be down to 9,000 feet for Salga. So knowing we are going to be within range at Salel, we can actually go straight for 9,000 feet here. Also, we are down to 18,000 feet now, so we can go and pre-configure our altitude for the destination. So if we show information for Brisbane, we can see Q1020. So instead of this being on standard calibration, we want 1020. So I'm just rolling it and you can see 1020 now is showing up, which means the altitude is now accurate above sea level, corresponding to the destination airfield. So our altitude reading is accurate because altitude is read by air pressure. Therefore, air pressure varies with the weather barometric pressure as we call it so we need to be at 9,000 feet for Salga which we are doing and we're holding or a bit fast so we're just going to extend again this is the headwind has slackened off even further so I've extended the air brakes ever so slightly just to pull us back down to 250 knots if you do get the chance to sit behind the wing in the passenger seat of an aircraft of a big jet and on descent you will see the air brakes gently open now and again so all, what you will have seen there if you watch the back of the wing if I just tap open the air brakes you'll see them flap up and you'll see that happen on commercial flights when they're on approach because they're just micromanaging the speed on the way down. So again, we don't need to be coming down this steeply anymore. Because we need to be at 9,000 for Salga, remember. So we can come back down off of that and go to 1,500 feet a minute, for example. You can see this predicted descent rate is creeping out now as our descent rate comes down to 1,500 but we're also managing to hold on to the speed now just about but the major reason it's taking longer now to glide is because we don't have the headwind we had before so as we get lower that headwind is vanishing so that was a high altitude wind that we were facing earlier and it's almost gone look it's down to 20 knots now we can actually find out go and look at this information at ground level 200 degrees 7 knots so the the wind is coming from the southwest 
so we'll be flying straight into the wind on a final approach which is why we to be honest that's why we've planned to come in this direction because i knew in advance the wind was from 200 degrees and seven knots so we'll have a slight headwind for landing okay something else we can check on the way down is the ILS frequency so you can see here it's 110.10 for 19 left 110.10 so we can go and check on the nav rad button ILS 19 left 110.10 it's already pre-configured because it came in via the flight plan we could override that and key something in ourselves, but it's already there so it picked that up automatically from the flight plan for us which is fantastic we we'll go back to the progress page just while we're flying. So that's telling us we're going to be into um, Brisbane at 23.04 based on our current progress. Coming down towards 10,000 feet, we're at 250 knots. We're looking good. We're going to be at 9,000 ahead of Salga. So let's pre-prepare then next thing we have to do after Salga is get to above 5,000 feet for OMGOV and 230 knots. So we'll go for 5,500 and, two, and oh, it's below 230 knots, so 220. So we'll go for 5,500 feet and 220 knots after we pass Salga. a shame isn't it we look at we're doing all this stuff in the cockpit we're not looking at any of the scenery and it's probably going to be very beautiful down below us let's go and have a look yeah you've got all these amazing sandbanks look and islands and we're missing all of it Okay. So the tone you heard was us become getting within a thousand feet of our target altitude on the descent. So we're going to pretty much be on the money for 9,000 feet at Salga. We're still a little bit quick. So I'm just tapping the air brakes open again to get us down to 250 knots. So if you remember, we wanted to be, when we get to OMGOV, we need to be at 5,500. So we'll go and key that in now. Or dial it in, I should say. So 5,500. We'll go down at a vertical speed of... We're just, again, we're watching the speed we can get away with, basically. 900. So we also want to get down to 230 knots. What did I say 220? Let's double check that. So we need to be below 230. So we'll go for 220. Now, are we managing to descend and lose the speed in time? We're possibly not going to lose the speed in time, but we'll, we'll wait and see. We've got plenty of time. So we can lose the range again, so we can see more clearly what's going on here. Yeah, that's a good view to have. So coming down to 220 knots. Also coming down to 5,500 feet. If we can have a look outside while this is going on, we actually get some scenery below to see at last. We've been at high altitude for so long. There's a wonderful beach we're flying along. So if we go and look at the map, we can find out where that beach is. It's along the edge of Norton Island. National Park. 
And over there on the other side of the bay we're going to find Brisbane. It's actually behind us over there in the cloud. Obviously it's in the cloud. Live weather. It's here to scupper us again. Okay, so let's go back inside. And let's reduce the range on this again. So OMGOV is the one where we need to be at 5,500. So you can see our projected descent rate is in, still in the, in the right ballpark. And our speed is down to the, where we needed it to be. So at this point, we can actually start to extend the flaps. So we've gone to one degree of flap, which actually prepares the geometry of the wing. It takes a while to start getting the flaps out, so it's just doing that for us. But it also gives us some drag, which is wonderful because that reduces our speed. And you can see this projected line is coming back in. That's because as the wing changes shape, it was actually giving us more lift, so it was harder to descend. But we've got more drag as well, which is helping us. So let's come down a bit more steeply, 1200 feet a minute, so we get to OMGOV at the, in the right ballpark basically. So then we need to be at 4000, above 4000, we'll go for 4500 and 185 knots for the next waypoint. So 4500 and 185 knots. And again, we'll use the air brakes to help the aeroplane slow down. So the, this is showing it up a little bit, look, it's having a job following the lateral plan. As soon as we straighten up out of this corner, we will switch over to approach mode. I mean, we've still got quite a run in, we're 20 miles out. But you can see we already have the diamond. So we can only engage approach mode from below the glide slope, so we are falling below the glide slope at the moment. So that's why it's important to come into these waypoints at the altitude they ask. So it gives you the time to do that. So we want to go immediately for 3000 now. And vertical speed, is it gonna let us? Oh, we have to select it. Vertical speed. No. Okay, we're going to go for approach mode. And we'll switch the screen over. So what this means is we're slightly off to the left. And we're, sl and we're below. At the moment. So we have engaged approach mode. So the aeroplane should acquire it. It's still going for 3,000. We'll, we'll tell it to only go for 3,500. Oh, it's already gone past there. That's a shame. Okay, we'll go for 3,100. So it should stop descending at 3,100 and then fly into the beam. Well, that's the plan. There we go. So we will now get the gear down. And we start extending flaps. So we've gone for 5 degree flaps now, or 10 degrees, sorry. And we can start, you can see the glide slope coming down. So the plane's holding level at 3,100 feet. When we approach the glide slope, so that's the invisible line down to the runway apron, at 3,000 feet, when we hit that, the plane should start descending all on its own and we can start getting rid of the speed at the same time. So yes, the plane started descending. We've asked for a slower speed and we're extending the flaps now. So the undercarriage is down. 
Landing lights are on. Can't see anything of the runway yet. But we're still quite a long way out. This is where it gets really interesting. Or it is for me anyway. So you can see if we just extend the range slightly. Yeah, it's just 10 miles out now. On the glide slope. Oh, the plane just hit a bit of a wobble. So it's because we have this 12 knot crosswind going on. So if we look up, there's the runway directly in front of us. Just as we come out of the cloud. So this is going to be interesting to see what happens if... I'm, I'm not going to let it auto land. I don't think it's got auto land. So... I'm going to get to a few hundred feet. In fact, we could do it from here. Should we fl hand fly it this last bit? So, to hand fly it, what we will need to do is disengage the autopilot. I can, I'm going to use a button on the stick to do that. So you get a warning. Disengage the auto throttle. So it's now I am fully in control of the engines and the, the direction of the aircraft. Just to prove that, we're going to steer, because we've gone off to the, the left sorry to the right and we're steering back left so we've got um, instruments to help us with this so that's our position relative to the center line and that's our position relative to the glide slope so we know if we are off to the right or the left so we're going for the final stage of flaps and we've got the engines to idle going a bit fast so I'm going to engage the air brakes a little bit we're off now to the right slightly. We're a bit high. Air brakes back off. Still a bit high, but we're just coming down gently. The trick is not to do anything suddenly, because a 747 can't change direction suddenly. Quite worried about those trees. to 50 knots so we're going to take the high speed exit from the runway here use wheel brakes now for the rest of the braking so I should have I should have announced I actually went for reverses once we were rolling on the runway as well so there we go we can turn the landing lights back off before we blind somebody and again the strobes would come off but I'm concentrating on steering and I don't have a co-pilot here to do that for me and we can come straight off here and go and find a gate I'm not sure if we're going to get past that traffic actually with a 747 but we'll, we'll have a look <laughs> it should be fun let's see how much manoeuvring room we've got bit of a tight squeeze isn't it 
Oh, hello, we've got the Death Wish fan has come to meet us. And he's pancaked himself under the undercarriage. So we'll follow the lines, at least to a, to a fashion. Something you do find with the Salty Simulations mod is the ground handling of the 747 is massively better than it was previously. So we'll go for this centre parking position over here. Go directly towards it and then swing in right, just to straighten up. Okay, parking brake on. Uh, next thing you would do typically is go and switch on the APU or we have got external, oh we left the external power on which was a mistake again, I didn't have a checklist. Uh, you would typically go and, does that mean it's available? Yes, because we parked in a bay we have got external power available. So we don't even have to worry about the APU to provide power. So they've plugged in immediately on the ground. So then we can disable or switch off the engines without having to worry. So there we go. Obviously there's a sequence to switching all the buttons off above our heads, so like all the fuel pumps and everything. So we obviously you would go around, but you have a checklist for that, and I haven't got one in front of me, so... The real process here was just to show you functionally, this aeroplane seems to work pretty well. I'm actually quite impressed with it. So let's go and turn some lights off. So strobe off, beacon off. Um, yeah, we're looking good. So I am massively impressed. So obviously we can play games again with this, where where you might normally in, in Flight Simulator have to go and call the radio multiple times to get the jet bridge and things. If we use the pushback mod to do it, we can get everything at once. So we can say, yes, we want fuel, power, catering, the jetway, and baggage, please. And that will all happen very quickly. They've just opened the door at the side of the aircraft and the jetway is being manoeuvred into place. And here comes the baggage car. Oh, do we have to open the doors for him? Cargo. Aft door open as well for the catering truck when he decides to sort his life out. Oh no, it's opened the wrong it's opened the one right at the back. Okay. So there you go. The Salty Simulations mod on the Asobo 747, and we did a flight from um, Sydney up to Brisbane, and we had a look at various things in the autopilot, and it seemed to behave itself, and it was very easy to control on approach as well, I have to say. So there you go, survive to fly another day, and I'm going to end the recording there, and we'll see you again soon. Disembark the passengers now. Okay, see you soon.